Hey everyone! How's everyone doing? Ready for another AMA session? Got my tea, got my water, some all prep this time. Drank some more water before the session too. <laughs> Need to get into a habit of that. Hey bikes! How's it going? Let's have a look-see. <laughs> Water, good. Alright, we're gonna dive into some Planet Coaster and Jurassic World stuff today. Got some questions about those, so I'm gonna be diving into them. Let me open up some linkies. Yeah, I just keep forgetting about my water. Like, I have one glass and then I drink it all and then I forget about it for the rest of the day. Uh, let's have a look. Water bottle! Yeah, I had a water bottle before. I got one from, uh, from Ubisoft. That, but that worked really good. But there was something wrong with, um, I don't know, I think it was like the plastic seal thingy on top. So, yeah. That didn't last too long either. <laughs> yeah, I should get one. I should get like a proper one. That doesn't fail on me. Uh, let's have a look here. Clean canteen? Okay, let me look that up. Clean canteen. Okay. Yeah, I'll give this a look. This looks interesting. Thanks, Hamish. Custom printed solutions. <gasps> if we can get one with the Beyond Extent logo on it, that would be awesome. <laughs> the Fisk. I'm just going to open a couple of tabs with these. Fisk. What a bottle. Oh no, it's flask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just realized. Oh, well. That's actually the one that I have. That's the one that we got from Ubisoft. But, for some reason, something, like I could use it one day and then like the, the, well, maybe I'm doing it wrong. Then the top, like it, it always had like a bad smell to it. I mean, I'm using clean water, I'm cleaning it every day, right? So, <laughs> I think it, maybe you're supposed to switch out like the, the plastic sealants. I cleaned that one every day too, but. I don't know, there was still like a weird smell coming off of it. I need to have another look at it. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. Yeah, I have... Well, when I'm talking about like the plastic... There's like a plastic ring that seals like the top of the bottle, right? To the to the main body of the bottle itself. It's inside of the... Of the... Uh, of the cap. So, I don't know. I need to give it a try. 
Because that's literally the one that I have. So. And if it works for you, then it means that I'm doing something wrong. All right. Hey everyone, all the lurkers in the back too. How are we all doing? Um, smells neutral on your end. Okay. Yeah, maybe I'm doing something wrong when I'm cleaning it or something. I don't know. But it's good to know that it's <laughs> that I'm doing something wrong. Then at least I know that I'm that I need to try something a bit more. Um. So, for everyone that's new to these AMA challenge, uh, challenges, EMA sessions, right? Um, feel free to just ask any question in the chat. First, we're going to go through some of the questions that we have from the community. Those are people that have signed up through the Patreon and have access to the Discord community. Um, so, we're going to go through a couple of those questions first. And then we'll be going through the chat and, and answering those questions as well. Um, Feel free to pitch in with any of the topics that we're going to be discussing, right? This is more like a discussion. So if the question that you have is related to the question that we currently have, feel free to fire away and I will be discussing that um, as we're going through the question to sort of keep it a little bit consistent. Okay, well, let's dive in. Um, we got the first question from Leon. Do you have any tips or advice for doing environments, props, or small sets that are supposed to be looked at from far away? As in, let's say, Planet Coaster. Um, I think it's a good question. Um, there are a lot of things that we can look at, right? Um, let me switch my screen for a sec. So, if we're looking at the Planet Coaster stuff, for example... What you will see is, um, let me grab some more interesting stuff. Um, let's go into this one, I guess. Hey, Judster5, how's it going? So when it comes to these assets that are supposed to be looked at from far away, the top most important thing is always have like a good, strong silhouette. A silhouette is always going to do most of the heavy lifting. So you can see that you you have this boat, for example. You have these snakes. They all have like really pronounced silhouettes. Um, these statues, for example. These are all modular kits, by the way. So you can, you can snap off like the top of this one and put it on this one. Um, but they all have like really, really pronounced silhouettes. Um, this is, there's obviously a balance to it, right? Um, when we're talking about these building blocks, for example, they are limited by their usability. So you can't really go all out on the silhouette. It's more about having it snap to all the other pieces in a modular way. Um, for example, I don't know if I have like any good, good examples in here. Um, same applies for the trees as well, or like the, the boats with like this pipe sticking out of it. It, it just adds a little bit more to the silhouette than just like a, a normal boat, right? Um, these statues are a good example. Um, the reason why you focus on a strong silhouette is you want to make it recognizable from a distance because you're going to be looking at it from such a, such a distance away, right? Um, also, in these games where you have literally tens of thousands of pieces in your camera view, um, you're going to run into some serious issues if you don't optimize well. So that is the second point. You need to be able to get the most bang for your buck. So if you have a good silhouette, that's really going to help you with getting... Um, getting like a good shape out of it, right? Um, also, what helps is contrast. In Planet Coaster, for example, we had customizability in terms of colors. So 
the yellow and the red that you see here on this on this example they can all be recolored to like any color um so this is the base but then you could change the colors and change it to like something completely different um so if you have more flexibility in terms of the colors that you can use i would also use contrasting colors to make it stand out from a distance um because as you can see like some of the elements here they kind of blur into each other especially if you were to zoom out further than this and helping helping with that is is the contrast right you can make it stand out from a distance um Let's have a look here. Um, props are small sets that are supposed to be looked at from far away. Same plan closer. Yeah. Optimization is key um, with this. Again, right? Like you... The reason why most of it also looks a bit blocky when it just comes to the modular set is because it was cheap too. It's way cheaper to just have like, um, what is it like, a set of really simple shapes like this that are like super versatile and you can kind of make your own things with it. Rather than having like really unique stuff that takes up a lot of polys and a lot of texture budget too. So yeah, like these, these snake pieces for example... Those are like compiled into like these larger snakes. They're all modular, all snapped together. You could build anything, anything with these trims. Um, and that's also, I mean, that's also the core of Planet Coaster, right? It's we give you the pieces and you build your stuff with it. Um, another thing, if... If we're talking about props or like small sets, try to optimize the textures. Um, try to optimize the amount of textures, like the sizes of textures. Because, again, if you're trying to render like a massive amount of stuff, you need to be able to optimize it as much as you can. Um, if I remember correctly... What happened is as soon as it would be built for the actual game, all the textures would be, I think from certain sets, would be compiled into like a large atlas. So this atlas would always be in memory. Um, but that would make it like way quicker to load in assets. Um, I think that's how we did it. Let's have a look at like another picture. Um, this is like a coaster. It's not really relevant to this question. Yeah, like if you just have a look at these sets, right? Like the, the possibility what you can build with these sets. And like the amount of pieces that were eventually in the set. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Like the stuff that you can build with it. And again, this is... This is, uh, again, using the color variation, right? So now it's purple. You can change that to whatever color you want to. Um, yeah, let's have a... I'm thinking about other, other things that could help with props from far away. Hmm... What do you all think? When when you're trying to construct props that are meant to be looked from far away, what is the first thing that comes to your mind that you would do in terms of like um, technical technical aspects? yeah i think definitely the most important part is just having a strong silhouette to still make them stand out from a distance yeah right silhouette 100 percent. i think that's the most important thing the rest is all more technical stuff that i brought up 
Yeah, obviously these pieces, they're all like modular kit pieces, right? So you can't really do that much with when it comes to silhouette. You're fairly limited to making them modular. Yeah, I mean, this is a good example. Like having, having good contrast. Having like popping colors in there. Really making them stand out from a distance. Like this is super recognizable as a set. This was fun to work on. It's making like cute snowmans. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, I hope that helps, Leon. Um, then for the next question, this is from Adam. Um, oh, before we dive into that, that's a good point, Bikes. That's a really good point. Um, don't make it too noisy because if you think the noise is okay from like the distance that you're normally looking at, if you zoom out, that noise is only going to get worse. That's a really good point. So to offset the, the comment that I had about the, the contrast, right? Um, you need to be careful that you're not overdoing the contrast either. Because then, like Bike said, it might run into uh, you might run into issues where it just becomes like really noisy from a distance. So that's a really good point. All right, let me. Um, you know what? Let me swap these around now that we have everything on screen. Uh, the next question is from Leonax, and then we'll dive into the question from Adam. Um, so Leonas, Leonax asks, I was wondering how the damaged monorail station was made in Jurassic World. Does it share the same UVs as the original model? Good question. Um, this can apply to any building that we did in Jurassic World. Um, so let's pick like an example, right? Because this stands out to you probably. Um, so... To give a little bit of context, what we would have in the game is we would have these natural disasters that would happen on your island. So there would be like a giant tornado or something striking down on your island. They would go over, well, they would damage like certain sections of your park, including like this monorail station, for example, where you can see that this is the intact version. And then there's like a, a zoomed in shot from like all the... um. All the damage that it's done. So the question is what is happening here? Like how is this happening, right? Like how are you treating these these damaged sections on this monorail station? So what we literally do here is um let me take my snipping tool. We have a couple of separated models, or like not models, but like um sections on these monorail stations. So, for example, we pick like a couple of sections like this section. I think it was something like this. And then this one was a separate one as well. I think this one could be damaged. And these are all like separate models. So we would have like the, the main station, which was like one model. And then we would have like um, separate, separate um, groups of assets. Or like chunks that were separated from the main the main bit. The reason why is when this gets hit by a storm, the storm is usually big enough so that it obscures what's happening within the storm, right? That's the reason why the storms are usually so big. Is that as soon as a storm hits here, for example, we swap out this model for the damaged model of that version. So if we go back to this, you can see this on the towers, right? So I'm thinking that the two towers and the roofs, because they're so close together, might be one uh, collection. And then as soon as the storm hits, we would literally swap out this asset for a different asset. Uh, oh yeah, you can see. You can see that we have like some, some damage here too. 
And this also included like the rubble on the floor and like some extra damage um, decals, right? And also the, the VFX that you see was all, they were all included within those collections. So as soon as a storm hits, it would just uh, swap out one of these sections for like another one. Um, then, onto your question, does it share the same UVs as the original model? No, because they are separate collections, right? They are separate assets. We can treat them differently. Um, I think it was a bit of a tricky workflow. If I remember correctly, we kind of did something like a second UV workflow that I'm currently using in my scene too. So we would take the original... Well, the way... If we take a step back, right? The way that we would construct these damaged assets is we would cut out the original one, duplicate it so we have the original one there, the one that we just attached to the building again as like a separate piece. But then we would also take that original one and destroy it without destroying the UVs. So there was like a lot of, a lot of precision work that needed to be done that we could retain as much of the original UVs as possible. The reason why is because we didn't we didn't really want it to make like a new texture set or anything like that. We didn't want to create like new textures. Um, because we were already going to do so in the second UV set. The second UV set we used for um, a second mask. Just for additional dirt and damage on top of it um let me see if i can kind of find like a good example for that wait no 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 now i remember sorry it's been a while um we had a second uv set for these entire buildings to do like dirt and grime and all that stuff. So we couldn't really, we didn't have enough wiggle room within the UVs to to do like a second UV set because we already had one for the entire building. So if I remember correctly, if I'm, if I take a step back again, we, Yeah, I mean, the main thing remains the same, right? Like, we would create, like, the destroyed, the destroyed asset by not touching any of the original UVs as much as possible. Um, so that's what made it kind of tedious to work with, right? Because we also had, like, separate, separate interior bits that we kind of needed to work with or maybe even add, like, a different material to. So, if we go back to your question, does it share the same UVs as the, as the original model? Yes. Um, instead of no before, I got, I got a little bit confused. So, yes, they do. Um, except for the parts that are new. So, you can see some of these interior bits where we have, like, an insulation bits hanging out or like maybe the interior cubicles they were a separate texture set compared to the other ones sorry about that confusion it's just been a while um hey lloyd thanks for the subscription man appreciate it buddy um let's have a look is there anything more that we want to Elaborate on here. It's kind of a, you can kind of see it here where we have like these longer streaks stripping down. That's like a second UV set, um, adding decals and like ground dirt and all that stuff. And we we altered those inside of Substance Painter. Um. So yeah, I hope that helps, Leonax. Um, are there any other questions about this? Workflow. I know that I got kind of confusing in the middle there. So if there's anything you want me to clarify, feel free to just drop it in the chat. And then we can go through it. 
These were pretty fun to work on, though. We were pretty restricted with these kind of buildings, but I think we did a did a really good job of making them look good. These these electrical stations were really fun to work on, to be honest. I don't know, something about mechanical stuff, I guess. <laughs> I think this was also the time when I was building um, my last Bastion scene, too. Yeah, this stuff was pretty, pretty interesting to work on. Let's have a look. Yeah, I think that's the only one that we have here. Well, from Jurassic World. There is some more stuff that I worked on, but it's not on my portfolio, I think. Because some of the stuff was pretty minor. Alright, cool. Seems like there are, no, there are no more questions about this then. So let's move back to, to this. And then let's dive into the last question. Um, this is sort of an expansion on the first question. Um, Adam asks, what to consider when you're making um, isometric assets in general, if you have any experience? Um, just for the record, I don't have any experience with making isometric assets, but let me see if we can, uh, if we can help you out here. What to consider on how to approach making them so that they look good top down? I've been thinking about isometric 3D person area from forever at this point. Um, yeah, it depends on what you what you're looking for top down, right? Like straight top down, because then it almost becomes. Well, I look at it like a like a normal map that you're baking down onto a flat plane. You need to make sure that the silhouette stands out from top down again. Um, so this is, this is also the, the same thing that, that we talked about with the planet coaster stuff, right? Where the main importance is always the silhouette. So that's, that's the same. That's going to be applied here in an isometric 3d person area. Um, Yeah, but other than that, I don't really I don't really have any specifics, right? Nothing specific about like isometric because I never worked in that in that art style before. Um I'm trying to think about anything that could be helpful. Yeah, I can't really come up with anything for specifically isometric stuff. Yeah, I'm sorry about that, Adam. Um, all right, so those were the questions that we had for today. It's a pretty short one compared to what we had last time. Um, so we can dive into some into some questions on the chat if you want. Like, feel free to just ask me anything, right? Anything goes in this chat. So feel free to just dump it in there and then we we can discuss it. Meanwhile, I'm going to have a look. Best pizza toppings. Um, best pizza toppings. I just like a bunch of cheese, honestly. Like a, a four cheese is probably going to be my all-time favorite. Um, when we... Oh, God. When we, when we lived in the UK, we had our favorite pizza ever. Um, it was from Perfect Pizza. I think they are now they're now rebranded. It's like uh, I don't know if it's a chain, but it's in it's in Cambridge. And let me think. What did we order? It was always like a a pizza with shrimp, uh, spinach, I think, uh, red onions, and I think that was it. I mean, that was so good. 
And then obviously with cheesy crust, right? Because if you if you want to go full pizza, I mean a cheesy crust is always always needs to be in there. That is adventurous. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Juicer. Now, now I want to have pizza too. Damn it. What What are your favorite pizza toppings? If we're talking about it anyway. Oh, you saw something about isometric stuff, bikes? Let me see if I can find it. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of good examples, right? Um, probably like the most recent game I played with that kind of. Well, it's not fully isometric, but it kind of has that top-down feel to it. It's like Ruiner. Um, that's a pretty good example for a game like that. Let me... Uh, no, it's not purely isometric, I think. It's been a while. Oh yeah, I do love my pizza though. It's actually been a while since we had one. I think for the last couple of months we've been ordering... When we order, it's usually like... I don't know, like two times a month or something? But then we, we usually get burgers. I think we're going through like a burger phase right now. <laughs> Norse Vertex. Hey! Welcome to the chat. What is your favorite Far Cry game? Uh, let's see. Where did I start in Far Cry? I never played 1 and 2. Um, Did I play 3? I think I played 3. I played 4. No, I didn't play 4. I played 5. I think I only played like 3 and 5, I think. From those 2. I mean... Choice is kind of limited, right? Um, um, I don't know. I I did really like five because it it had this really really chill feeling about it. Like as soon as you went into like the woods or like the the forest, it was really good. Um, there were obviously some weird fucking things that happened in that game where. I would be cruising in a in a chopper, like just completing outposts, and then you would be forced into like one of the one of the um what is it? Like one of the mission campaigns, like campaign missions. And it would literally be you flying in a helicopter and you would be falling asleep because someone hit you with a dart, even though you're in a fucking helicopter, like all the way up in the sky. It's like, wait, what? I mean, obviously they need to... <sighs> I think that was my biggest disappointment because I remember in, in the beginning of the game, they kind of have this like uh, introduction to that mechanic, right? Where it's like you're being hunted. So I was like, oh, cool. Like you're properly being hunted. But it's more like, no, we're just going to spawn like a bunch of enemies. And as soon as you get hit once, you're going to faint and then... You're going to go into like a story mission. It's like, oh, okay. I thought it was like, I thought it was more like a wave based thing where it would get like perpetually harder up until a point where you couldn't survive or something. That would make more sense, but not as soon as you would get hit that, that you would just fall asleep, right? I mean, that felt so forced. But. I do enjoy like just the atmosphere of the game and just walking through the forests and yeah, the pace and the mood. Like I really love that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I, I also remember like just walking through the woods, right? And just like really enjoying the atmosphere. Sun was coming up. You would have like nice sun rays coming through the woods. It was like. It's a perfect moment in games right. Where you're just like so immersed into it. And then obviously you would get fucking hammered by a turkey. That just like. I don't know. Got really aggressive all of a sudden. Oh man. 
Those damn turkeys in that game, man. They were so annoying. <laughs> Burgers are so good. Hell yeah. Well, we went to the shop yesterday, and this is something that I that I wanted to try for a long time. We we got those um what are they called? Like the vegan burgers. God damn it, I forgot the brand. Um Beyond Meat, I think. Those uh one of those burgers. I wanna I wanna give it a test. I want to give it a test. I've been curious about that for a while. So I'm curious how that's how that's going to work. Let's have a look, bikes. What did you link? You're expanding into food. <laughs> no, this is just because I have an insatiable hunger. Not insatiable hunger, but just... I don't know, man. I do love food. I'm just... I love food. <laughs> there's, there's no two ways about it. Just to make sure... Oh, hold on. Oh, okay, so... If it's not, it's a great talk anyway. Yeah, I listened to this like a while back. To create good-looking assets for Heroes of the Storm. Oh, that's interesting. I can't remember that part. I'll um, I'll need to give it another try. I'll share it in the community too again. Thanks, bikes. Uh, what about pickles? Oh, I don't know about that one. I don't know about that one. I do not like pickles. However. <laughs> well, this is my point of acceptance, right? Um, the last couple of times when we ordered burgers, I couldn't be bothered by getting them out. Like, I was just like, okay, I'm just going to eat the pickles. And normally it kind of ruins my experience with burgers, but the last couple of times, I could... I don't know. <laughs> Pickle gate. <laughs> Uh, the last couple of times, I, I, I sort of got used to it. So maybe this is me slowly but surely accepting pickles, right? It's kind of weird because my dad is one of those people that... I don't know if he still does it, but he, he could just have a jar of pickles and he would just eat it all the time. Just whenever he felt like it. So I don't know. I must... uh. I must have taken that gene from my mom, I think. <laughs> Pickle gate. Oh my god. This is giving me some good inspiration for uh, like emotes or something. <laughs> oh, we need to... That's the thing that we need, we still need to do. Get some... Oh, get like a an emote challenge or something. I know that I keep talking about it, but that would be would be awesome. be getting none i know i've been so bad man i'm just not the best when it comes to that stuff if you want to use the nun then it's it's only in the discord for now Ooh, making it a challenge yeah that would be interesting Um, big collab beyond extent and, and like beyond meat. <laughs> yeah, wink, wink. Let's make it a challenge. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that would be would be quite interesting. But man, I'm we're we're gonna get so many memes out of this. I think I think Derek is gonna be is gonna be taking taking part in that one for sure. I think we're gonna see some ridiculous stuff coming out of that one. If we do it. Uh let's have a look here, right? Uh, 
Oh, do we do we have any anonymous questions? I don't think so. Yeah, so again, if you're new to this to this chat, right? If you just want to ask anything, feel free to just fire away. Fire away. Talking about Far Cry games, I'm looking forward to playing the next one, though. I'm looking forward to playing that one. Do you get many anonymous questions? Um, occasionally. Like, we, we had two last week, and then we had, like, a couple of ones where we didn't really have anything. Um, so, yeah, occasionally, we, we do get some good ones. I think I just love to keep it there, because some people might not be comfortable having their, their name attached to the question, or maybe it's, like, so personal that they don't want to don't want to have that link between the question and like the the person asking it right we got some we got some pretty good ones like a while back when we had some people asking for um how to deal with a lead that doesn't really listen to you or doesn't listen to your feedback or isn't might not be interested in your personal growth and i think in that case because it could be personal uh, you never know who's gonna, I mean, who's gonna pop up in this chat or who's gonna be in the community, right? Um, that word spreads around. So in that case, it's it's definitely, it's definitely good to have a, an anonymous questionnaire for that. I was kind of wondering how how extreme the questions we're gonna get in an anonymous questionnaire but people have been have been really polite which is which is awesome i do need to i do need to mention that actually like the the questions that we've been getting the the professional nature of them and like how how interested people are in just like growing has been really inspiring to see Didn't catch many of those. Um, I think when was that? I need to I need to dig it up, but uh I think it was like four or five episodes ago. It's been a while since those specific questions. What's the coolest piece of tech or tool you saw lately? Look, I'm just gonna say it here, NFTs are pretty fucking cool. Like, the, the potential of it in the future. Well, already, right? Like, that is probably, like, the, the coolest piece of tech that I've seen. Um, because, I mean... When, even... Well, the thing, the thing that needs to change is definitely, like, the ecological footprint, right? But they're working on that. Um, but if you just look at NFTs and... and of what it what it offers digital artists in the future if you really start looking into it like the the royalties that you could get from like reselling stuff later on um obviously this is ignoring like all the fucking crazy speculation that's going on now and which will be going on for like a long while too um the space is just really crazy because it's so new and especially because I mean, everyone is coming into the space right now because they see big numbers, right? Big monetary value to it. But I think once all that stuff dies down and artists are going to be more in control of it again, I think that space is going to be really interesting to watch. Um, coolest piece or tech of tech or tool? Um... I mean, NFTs are definitely, like, the biggest impact. Other than that, I don't know. Huh. It's a good question, though. Usually, I just look at stuff that's interesting, but then I never really follow up upon it. 
So it mustn't it mustn't be that big of an impact then. Um oh there is one thing that I'm really curious about is geometry nodes inside of Blender. That's a thing that I'm that I'm also keeping my eye on and how that's going to evolve. Because I've been thinking about maybe learning Houdini at some point, right? That has always been sort of on my mind. But the stuff that I'm seeing out of geometry nodes inside of Blender is awesome. And I feel it could be like a gateway into Houdini, I think. So it's like kind of bridging the gap. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, if... If the same development was happening in Max or Maya, I would probably talk about that too. But I feel, I feel that, I mean, I mean, a lot of people are going to agree with this too. Like Max and Maya are stagnant, even though they are still the tool that's mostly widely used in the industry to model, right? At this point, they are stagnant. Like there's no, there's no excitement about it. There's no, well, there is probably some excitement about it. Like take it with a bit of salt, right? Like I've been out of that ecosystem for a while. So there is still development happening, but just the, the amount of development that I'm seeing with Blender and like the people that are, that are like making awesome add-ons on it. Um, that's the good thing about all the hype that is generating, right? Like a lot of people are making a switch to Blender, which also makes it more interesting for an add-on developer. Um, say, say that's how you make your money, right? As an example, it makes it way more interesting for you to develop one for Blender than it was for Maya. Because all, all the hype, like all the, well, hype is the wrong word. Like all the excitement, all the... All the people that are moving into Blender, like that's, <laughs> I mean, there's there's way more potential than there is compared to 3ds Max and Maya, at this point, because it's also free. Everyone can just download Blender, and then if they're looking for good good add-ons, that's where you come in, and they don't have to feel guilty for already paying so much for a program to just use it, right? Um, I mean, definitely the Blender cult, right? But I think the Blender cult is also like a good thing when it comes to that. If you're developing stuff for Blender. Because honestly, yeah, I mean, this is, this is my, my personal opinion, right? Like, uh, I'm... This is sort of like the, the age-old Apples and Windows uh, conversation. Well, where it's like... Where it's like, who cares? Like, it's just a tool. Like, if I if I needed to work in Max, I would do it. If I needed to work in Maya, I would do it. But at the moment, I'm, I'm just having the most fun with Blender. And also, again, monetary incentive, right? It's free. I, I don't have to be worried about... Um, releasing new stuff just to pay off my Maya or Max license if I want to do commercial stuff because I'm interested in commercial stuff. Um, but not to a capacity where it makes sense for like a, a proper business, right? It's just me as an individual. While Blender is crazy, but I don't see the industry switching soon because of the amount of custom tools that are already made well, it depends what you define by switching, right? If you if you if you are thinking about those those custom tools, which is a really good point to point out because you're absolutely right there. Um, if you are waiting for those to be ported to Blender, that's not going to happen anytime soon. But what is happening is people are modeling in brand, in Blender. Um. And then just porting it into Max or Maya. And then just setting it up really quick and getting it into the engine. That's how I'm working too, by the way. And it's way more pleasant than me learning like an additional 3D software. Now I just need the basics of like scene setup and like naming conventions and all that stuff. 
so I can just model in the program that I find really pleasant to model in, get stuff from Blender into Max or Maya, and then I'm done. I have to do a little bit of setup, and then the custom tools do all the rest. But yeah, I do 100% agree, Bikes. Um, the pipeline that's already there is not going to change anytime soon. They they are working on it, right? But it's going to take a while before it can fully replace all that stuff. It's also a big monetary investment, right? Just like imagine all the custom tools that have been made for, I don't know, like just say like a game like Far Cry, right? Like over those years, over over those years, like so many custom tools have been made specifically for for the engines, for the workflow. They are not going to just switch that up to Blender just because artists are jumping to Blender. It's way... It's way easier for them to just say, like, look, we'll try to make it work um, platform or, like, export agnostic, right? Where as long as you get an FBX out of it and you can port it into the, the program that we use for the workflow, then you're good. Have a look here. Frosties. Hello. Yeah, I agree with you about NFTs. So sad that Twitter now looks like a battlefield about it. Yeah. But I mean, honestly, Twitter is Twitter. Like they are gonna go on a fucking rampage for a couple of days, and then they're gonna look for the next thing. Right now, the reason why it feels so overwhelming is because it's artists, right? NFT is like close to art and also the ecological impact. Which is absolutely right to point out, by the way. But there are promising features coming to that in the future. But on the other side, that's also not going to stop people from getting in. Because they want to get money at the, mo at the moment. And you can't stop that. So even if they were to put pressure on like the big artists, which uh, a lot of Twitter is at this point, <laughs> they don't care. Like they're they're just gonna do what they what they want to do, um, and I hope that the ecological impact of that is gonna be solved. And I'm keeping my eye on the space. I won't be participating in it currently, but I think it's a really interesting space. But I also I also don't think that it's that it's like a really controversial topic. It's like look, we have this new thing starting up. And the negative side of it is the ecological impact. But right now, like you, you get vilified if you, if you do anything, except acknowledging that ecological impact, which again, is also a part of Twitter. It's all black and white, which it isn't in real life. <clears throat> but it's unfortunate, though. But that's also why I disconnected from Twitter a bit. Um, whenever something like this happens, there's just like a wave and I just disconnect a bit and then... <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to go on a rant on NFTs. I also, if it comes up, right, I I do want to acknowledge it because I think it's an, it's an interesting space for the future. Um, North Vertex, you are working on Far Cry 6, right? Um, do you know or have an overview of everything that's going to be in the game? Plot, locations, missions, music, Easter eggs, or are you still going to have a lot of surprises when you play it yourself? Without going into details, I'm still going to have a lot of surprises myself. Um, I got to be careful with what I say here, right? But that's, that's all I can say about it. Renewing the Maya license for personal work must be painful. Yeah. When I when I switched from Maya to Um Hold on. Like when I switched from Maya to, to Blender, I was still using the what is it? Like the educational license, right? Like the student license. So I never 
I had like a couple of months where I paid for Maya LT because I was trying to do commercial stuff. Well, I was doing commercial stuff. Um, so as soon as I started modeling commercially, I switched over to Maya LT. But then I was, there was just so much pressure because even with Maya LT, I was paying like, I don't know, 40, 40 euros a month or something, right? Um, I mean, it was it was this additional pressure that I didn't really like. And now I'm working in Blender. I don't have any of that pressure. I can just, I just do, do my own thing, right? Like I just work on my own timeline. I don't have to worry about like the monetary pressure that's put upon me. Um, and I just don't have to worry about that anymore. Which is honestly really great for me. Because it doesn't force me to just focus on on getting stuff out to make money, right? Honestly, I would switch if I wouldn't have a Maya that is really customized for my needs. But if a company said you need to switch, I would switch. Yeah, that's the thing. I don't think that's going to be happening soon, right? I don't think... Well, this is what I hope. Not what I think, actually. I hope that in the future... You go to a company and the modeling package that you model in doesn't matter. They only want you to get like an FBX that just slots in to their workflow, whatever program that is, right? Um, that would be the ideal for artists because then you don't ever have a case anymore where you have a person for, um, I don't know, a specific job coming in with like crazy levels of experience in maya but then they work in max so all that experience is gone it's kind of unfortunate got here at the nfts has a good space on my mute list on twitter i think it's unfortunate that people put it on mute this is my personal opinion again right i do i do realize why you would do it it can be overwhelming but I think it's going to be a really interesting space once all this Twitter stuff dies down. Um, we have Maya Indy now. How? Wait, Maya Indy. How expensive is that a year? Because I heard that it was. Yeah, exactly. Just art, no software pressure. That would be awesome. That's the thing that I hope. And that's also the thing that I enjoy about the current company that I work for, right? Is we we can just switch over within within reasons, right? It's easier with Blender because it's free. So there's a lot less legalities that come come with it. Um so if we're just looking at it from like a company perspective, right? Um it's easier for a company to approve a free program like blender because there's no legality attached to where say you come into a studio the studio is using 3ds max but you are a maya user then they need a specific license for maya that needs to be approved by by the company and all that stuff and they need to have budget for that too um so yeah I mean, it's just way easier for, if you compare the two, right, to for a company to approve Blender compared to Maya or, or Max in that case, if they're not already using it. All the stuff that I'm saying here is from like a perspective from my, well, my personal perspective within Ubisoft, right? So again, take that with a grain of salt that this might not apply to like smaller companies or like other companies. Uh, they might have a different policy. Doo -doo -doo. You're just sick of seeing NFTs. Yeah, I get it, Scott. That's also that's also why I I know where you're coming from. Because it's a space currently that's just like the, the fucking Wild West, man. And people are arguing like crazy. So, no, I definitely get where you're coming from. So... 
Yeah, I mean, I respect your decision too. This is not to, to shoot you down in any way. I think it's just unfortunate that with this, this, this shit that's going on right now, you would potentially lose out on like a future interesting thing. Right? Like a future interesting space. I mean, you can still unmute it back then. Like once people are done arguing, like Lloyd says. Um... Hey Mish, I'm very fortunate that where I'm at, where I'm at, I'm right now is happy for us to use Blender for what we need and use Maya for their in-house tools afterwards. But have you heard of companies being strict about it and like, nope, Maya only? That's a good question. Um, um, let me think. Have I heard about any experiences? No. No. I'm trying to think what be the, what would be the logic business wise behind it, right? Because this 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 sort of conversation comes down to at least that's what I'm thinking. This comes down to you're still trying to get the best talent in the industry working for your company, right? Because you want to build the best possible product at the end. So the way that I see it is that that is just a hurdle so if you if you say like we're looking for i don't know like a weapons artist and then like a, a senior weapons artist come knocking at your door and says like look i will make you killer guns but i'm i'm only working in max or blender or whatever modeling program they use right I don't think at that point, like, a, a studio would shoot itself in the foot by saying, like, oh, no, sorry, it's Maya only. I mean, there's probably examples of that, but might not be this, the best decision coming from a company. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate you looking out for me, buddy. How are companies handling custom tools and scripts? What do you mean, bikes? In what aspects? Just in terms of like how how they get built or how how they get um, what is it like maintained or how you as an artist interact with them? Getting Blender add-ons then approved again can be a pain though, as they often need to be checked by legal. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's also a very good point, Hamish. Um, that's a very good point. If you are using add-ons for Blender that are paid, it needs to follow the same process, right? Like that we talked about before with with modeling packages too. Um. Yeah, but the difference is if you pay for those scripts or not. Because the reason why companies are are um, cautious with that stuff is say you bought an add-on with a personal license or with, yeah, I mean, in this case, with like a personal license that doesn't apply for a company license, which are oftentimes like way more expensive. So if they know that you're using that add-on in a professional capacity at a studio, then you're technically using that tool illegally because you're, you're all, um, you're on the wrong license, basically. Oh yeah, if the scripts are free, then it's good. I don't think that's, then the same thinking applies like Blender, right? There's, there's no... Apart from, they, they probably still want to check it on security reasons, right? So it still needs to go through like a bit of a process if you want to be really thorough about it. Usually what happens is, um, say there's like a new tool. Um, we as artists get together and really explore the tool to really see how it can like be used not only by one person, but also by other people in the company, right? 
And then if if all the artists are like, oh yeah, we definitely need this tool, then we bring it forward to IT if it's a free if it's a free tool. And then they can kind of go through, check it for like security reasons. Because you never know. Some clever person might be writing a tool that just steals like personal data from like a, I don't know, like a, a Ubisoft studio, right? Don't want to have that on my conscience. Yeah, exactly. The whole space is just a mess right now. We will see if it if it's valid once the hype to grab quick cash dies down. Yeah, we'll see. I'm interested in that too. To see where it's going in the future. It has to check a lot of tools then. Um, usually... Well, it kind of depends, right? I think it depends how thorough they want to be. It also depends on how elaborate the script is. Let's say if it's just like a simple line of code. Um, I don't know. Let's let's just name like an export tool, right? That just exports from like Blender to to Max or Maya or whatever. That probably doesn't have to be checked. Like you're you're smart enough to open that tool yourself and then look at it. Um but in more elaborate cases where we have like a ton a ton of stuff in like a, a Python script or whatever, it might be worth to just grab IT. They might have their own tools that cover the scripts you use. Yeah, usually what happens... Um, again, talking from Ubisoft perspective, right? Um, there is a tool... A tool set that is already pre-approved by, by Ubisoft IT. So there's like an, an entire list of stuff that has already been checked and vetted by IT. Um, this can be like from, from all different places, right? Um, again, for some of the new people here, uh, this is like an AMA session that I do every Sunday. So if you have any questions about environment art, game development, well, it doesn't have to be. It can be anything that you want. Feel free to just drop it in the chat and we'll chat about it. my good tea here yeah i've been i've been i've been really enjoying like my time with blender since i switched like the, the switch was awkward as hell but i'm still discovering like a lot of stuff in, in blender too right um this, this kind of goes back to the question of what i'm excited for in the future um, and definitely like the geometry nodes that we talked about. I've also finally updated my batch exporter script. Now I can finally export selected. <laughs> which was the only feature that I was missing for my batch exporter. Which is uh, pretty awesome. So I should be set right now. Hopefully no more crashes of Unreal. When I'm working on stuff. Okay. I might start booting up like Unreal. Probably gonna do a bit more personal work in a bit. Try to get the roof pieces done for my scene. It's gonna be good. How's everyone else's work going? Well, personal work, I mean. Doesn't have to be professional. Do, 
Tschö. All right. I'm not seeing any more questions pop up, so this might be a good one to uh to sort of dial it down. Working on the high poly of this car. Awesome. Yeah, that car was coming going along well, man. Been relaxing. Oh yeah. Finished a, few, um, a piece a few days ago. Now working on a new one. Nice. That's awesome. Going from piece to piece. Not spending months and months on environments. <laughs> Been relaxing. Yeah, there's something I want to talk to you in uh, in private about, Hamish. I'll uh, I'll send you I'll send you a message soon. I got an idea brewing that I want to discuss. Um, but yeah, anyway. Uh, thanks everyone for being here this uh, this AMA Sunday. I'm doing these every Sunday, right? So if you think about stuff, if you, I mean, if you if you have any questions, you can uh, you can just pop in the chat, drop a question, discuss it together with all of us, and. Uh, Hopefully we, we can get some interesting discussions going. Getting back on track after my ignoring my new project. <laughs> uh, okay. Awesome. Thanks so much, people. Uh, I wish you all a good Sunday. And I hope to see you in the next one. It was awesome to have you all here. Good questions. Good discussions. And I wish you all a good day. See ya and talk to you later.